Yeah, you, you're going to be offline. Okay, okay. Just one second. Okay. Okay, hey, Mr. Jatta, um, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, Doctor. Okay, so um, let's begin. All right. Thank you, Doctor, uh, for being here again. Uh, we want to thank our audience. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, we're back here again this Sunday. There's noise behind in the background. Don't worry. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, so uh, uh, today we want to talk about. Uh, we want to revisit the uh, uh, civil service salary increase in the Gambia, and we will also talk briefly about um, uh, regional integration uh, in the context of. Uh, 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 trade between the Gambia and Senegal, and I will briefly uh, comment on Ali Fasala's uh, New Year uh, speech, uh, New Year address to the nation, uh, basically. Uh, uh, without taking much time, um, Dr. Conte will just go right into uh, our topics for today. Um, the uh, salary increases in the Gambia uh, for the civil side. Um, and I need to make it uh, pretty clear that uh, uh, we are not saying that uh, salaries uh, should not be increased. Salaries in the Gambia should not be revised. Um, what we are saying is that um, uh, salary increment in the Gambia needs to be properly looked at, um, uh, particularly in the in the face of uh, increasing inflation in the country, um, in the face of um, rising prices in the country, uh, in the face of widening inequality in the country. Uh, in the face of increasing poverty in the country. Um, um, I particularly am not an expert in this. Uh, basically, my goal is to uh, start a conversation about these issues. Um, and basically, more of asking questions, to ask questions um, of the people that are in politics. Look at this in a broad um, If the salary increases are done as an adjustment to inflation in the country, uh, that is understandable. But I think that should be a very narrow and very limited uh, salary increment. Um, the other concern that I have about the salary increases is that um, it seems to add to the widening inequality in the country. Uh, the bulk of the uh, this the increases in wages and salaries is pre pre proportionately is going to help the. Uh, benefit the um, the higher income bracket than the lower income bracket. So, my argument is that 
um, the salary increment is better for the economy if it is focused narrowly on those at the bottom ladder of the income ladder. Um, I would increase the salaries of nurses, teachers, government drivers, and you know others who um, are at the low end of the income income ladder. Um, I probably say, and I, I I'll leave this for Dr. Conte to make a determination. But I want to propose that probably uh, the salary increments should not go beyond grade nine. Um, you know, nine, 10, 11, 12, um, if you increase the salaries by the, by the percentage that uh, the government is proposing, um, I don't think it's gonna add any value to the Gambian economy. Um, those are the bottom ladder. Um, below uh, grade nine, uh, the increases in salaries will definitely add to uh, the uh, economic activity of the country and may help expand income um, and help families uh, meet the daily expenses uh, of the household. Um, so, And I bring this up because I have taken a look at Dr. Conte's uh, breakdown on the market, and it looks very apparent that um, um, the government uh, should definitely retake uh, or uh, reconsider uh, these increases and adjust it in a way that will be more helpful to the economy uh, than just putting more money who uh, probably do not need that kind of money again, um, especially in the face of mounting poverty, uh, mounting inequality uh, in the country. Um, another thing that I'm concerned about is that um, with the rise uh, in income, um, I mean salary increases in the country. Um, I believe, Dr. Conte, this is going to exhort an additional uh, pressure uh, in terms of widening of uh, because one would wonder where government is going to come up with this extra money to meet the payroll. Uh, increasing payroll demanded by the salary increase. Um, uh, so that is another concern that needs to be looked at while we discuss um, um, the increases uh, in salaries of civil servants. Dr. Conde, that much I want to say about the salary increases as just a revisit of what we discussed last week. Um, do you have anything to add to this? Yes, I do. And to be quite candid, uh, I've been adamant in uh, talking about this and I invited a fellow on Facebook to join us to talk about uh, the about this, the the two hundred and the weighted average, the weighted average of two hundred and fifty five percent on the salary increase. Mm -hmm. uh, if the person is listening and basing it on the accounting equation, and uh, this is not a subjective response, but uh, based on accounting principles that if you have expenditure, your equity will go down and then the simultaneous effect will be either you're going to pay cash. Under no circumstances most we heard, have heard of, only in the Gambia, where if you're going to incur an expenditure, it's going to be a liability, but the liability will have to be paid eventually. Uh, I want to go back to the scenario that I gave uh, that was the 2.8 billion 
a fiscal deficit before the salary increase that was included in the 2022 budget. I say if we have a modest salary increase of 50%, what would be the effect on the account equation and on the fiscal deficit? And when I did the computation, we have to borrow seven billion. We have to borrow seven billion more to add to the two point eight. That would be nine point eight if we have a salary increase of fifty percent. But now I want to share this with my listeners to say our listeners to say to say that this is what we have. Now, I want Gambians to see what I'm trying to do. Uh, this is not subjective. This is based on accounting theory. And the concept that you're going to use, you have to apply it. I can give you all the theories that I want to, but at the end of the day, by the way, is, uh, is with us. I have to I have to apply it. So let's go back here. The last time I showed the audience that the salary increase, this is the old scale. The grade one all the way to grade eleven. They did not have any they don't they didn't mention grade twelve salary. So the new salary is here, is here meaning that grade one. I will take a cup of coffee, please. Meaning that grade, meaning that grade, grade, uh, grade one will receive almost twenty thousand dollars. So that's an increment of eighty-three percent. That's a high increment. I want folks to see here that grades one, two, and three, grades, grade three salary increase will be 180%. So if we base it on that, that is 80% more than what I predicted. No, actually 120% more, 150% more. Okay with the bond. You're okay with the bond? No, yeah. you have cool, cool. I don't have any more today. I can leave if you're okay. 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 100 and, sorry about that, 129 percent more than what I had predicted if we had a 50 percent increase. And in that we have to borrow 7.7 7, 7, 7, 7 billion more. Now, I want you all to see here, grade four, if we maintain salary increase of 251 percent, that is for grade grade four. So do you all see the disparity? between grades one, two, and three, and the rest of the grades. So who who were the people who were sitting at the table when they were making these decisions? I bet it wasn't a grade four person. I bet it wasn't a grade five person. But you notice that the higher you go up on the scale, grade nine salary increment will be two, 385%. How is that possible in an economy that actually depends on grant gr grants? We depend on tax revenue. Notice that grade 10, the increase in the salary of grade 10 will be 426%. And then grade 11, the salary increase will be 435%. So here you have someone who was earning $103,000 a year you're going to bump that person's salary to 548000 Come on, let's be realistic. Is this, is this attainable? There is no way that we can be able to maintain this. So now, I want to come down here to base my argument, and anyone who wants to disagree with me, I want to tell you that I'm using this as an accountant, that we look at the accounting equation. We say assets equal liabilities plus equity. So here we have, okay, if I say we're going to the increase, remember I said if we are going to increase the salary by 50%, we will have to borrow $7 billion 
uh, dialysis. We have to borrow another seven billion dialysis. If we say we're going to increase salaries by 50%. Now, I want you to take that 50. I want you to take that five, divide it into 484, 434%. So now you have 80. I want you to multiply that 80 by 4. Where are we going to get the money? So now if I place this $4 billion on the accounting equation with the equity, uh, expenditure side, tell me where I need to go with that. Do we have the revenue to sustain that? When our revenue is only $14 billion. Then we have no choice. Do we have cash to pay? No, we don't have cash to pay. The only thing that we have to do is borrow. This is my argument against the 435% increase. If you're going to give increment on salaries, what you have to do is you do it gradually. And I will leave the economists to engage us on the effect of a salary increase. But with my knowledge in accounting, if you have to borrow money, it means that you as a borrower, you are not in charge when it comes to interest rates. So the person that you're going to borrow from will increase the interest rate because they have the money and you don't have. So that being the case, the interest rates will go up. So the Gambia government is going to be charged a higher interest rate, whether we are going to borrow domestically or whether we're going to borrow externally. What will be the effect of higher interest rates in an economy that only depends on importation and not exports? So if we if we if we if we put more money, more Gambian dollars is out there in circulation, what's going to happen to the value of the Gambian dollars relative to foreign currency? It's going to go down. So which means that our interest rates will go up. Having too much money circulating in the economy is going to water down our Gambian dollar seat. What I'm, what I'm kind of afraid that the central bank that's supposed to be independent, I am afraid that the central bank is going to print more money to sustain this increment. And if that happens, the Gambian dollar seat will devalue at least 25%. I hope the oil uh, uh, exploration that uh, the FAR company is doing, but FAR company is a bankrupt company anyway. A lot of Gambians don't know that, that FAR's total assets are in Africa. They have limited assets in, in Australia where they come from. I want folks to know if you look at FAR company's uh, balance sheet, they, only, they have less than 5 million US dollars in their bank. So which means that their, uh, uh, their quick ca cash is no more than $5 million, uh, $5 million US, uh, US dollars. So I don't want to take much of our time here. But again, I want to emphasize this. I am not against, I am not against salary increment. But I am very concerned that with limited uh, uh, revenue that we have in our country, uh, I am afraid, you know, that this is the wrong choice for the president. Uh, maybe what I don't understand here is that the people who actually are making these decisions, th this is this is self-serving. They are doing this for their own for for their own interest. And we as Gambians, we should be able to sit down and ask ourselves, what is the best way forward? Listen, we. We, we supported Barrow, and uh, he won the election. But we are not going to sit idle and allow folks to mess up with our economy to a point where they're going to increase salaries exponentially. That will have an a effect on our, on, on our economy. In fact, today when I spoke to someone in the Gambia, the person told me that with the salary increase, what has happened now in the country is that um, uh, merchants have now responded by by what by increasing prices. So, in fact, another area that I uh, said you know is that with the salary increase, 
uh, what do we need? What what do we need to do now? Because if they approve the budget in uh, in December for 2022, and now they are going out here trying to increase the budget, trying to increase the budget. So, what is the best way forward for our country? My suggestion will be to the president to con to reconvene parliament uh, to adjust the budget because right now we don't have the means to sustain this uh, increase in salary. So I'm going to stop right there, Mr. Gatta. Thank you, Dr. Conte. Uh, very well said. Um, I just wanted to add a few things to what you said. Uh, like you rightly said, um, the, uh, the impact of this on the deficit uh, budget deficit is quite concerning to me um, because part of the reason why we are facing inflation in the country is the effect of the budget deficit. Uh, so um, uh, any decision, any step that will increase uh, the budget deficit should be uh, really concerning uh, to all of us. Uh, but also the morality of all of these um, I think government, our goal right now should be uh, to reduce the burden of government on the taxpayers. Um, this decision to increase salaries, especially of the top um, uh, um, income earners in the country, is not serving that purpose. Uh, it is to widen, to increase the burden of the government on the taxpayers. Because we've got to remember, taxpayers are the ones paying for all these. And um, instead of delivering services to the people, we are using their resources to pay ourselves more and more. That is immoral to me. Um, I would rather see the bottom uh, um, uh, sectors of the uh, income earners, the bottom brackets, um, probably grade one, uh, up to nine, I could be a little bit more liberal, but probably well below grade nine, to have increases in their salaries, not anywhere above that. Um, it is not serving the interests of the people. Uh, government should not be um, a burden on the taxpayers. Uh, we have to trim down um, our expenses, operational expenses of government. Um, uh, that much I wanted to add to just what you said, Dr. Conte. And I think with that, um, uh, we will just leave this topic. I hope the government reconsiders this decision and try to, they may not scrap it totally. Uh, they may still increase salaries, mm -hmm. particularly um, uh, inflation adjustment, uh, adjusted increase in salaries. That I can understand, that I can agree with. Um, or even if they are not just going to do that, um, but they just want to increase salaries, it should be narrowly focused on those at the bottom end of the uh, income ladder, not those at the top. Um, um, and thank you again uh, for... Uh, let, yeah, I have a Dr. Dr. Jallo is trying to join us, and he said that his camera is being blocked. I don't know how that's possible. Oh, okay. Let me let me see. Uh, do you mind if I call him? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and call him. Okay, let me call him. Maybe he can set light on this too. Absolutely. Hello. Yes, uh, we are. We are online. We are live, and uh, you try to come in, and uh, I noticed. Yeah, that... I just get in. I just get in. I'm just from class. Just get in, and I just saw you guys are online. I said let me just tip in because I'm even busy. But I said let me just try to tip in. But uh, I'm on backstage, and then I don't know what actually happened because I my camera has been blocked. It's telling me your browser has blocked your mic and camera. So I'm trying to look at my browser. I don't know why. Okay, so we can allow you to come on uh, on the phone and talk. We are talking about the salary increase. So what's yeah. your, uh, Mr. Jada is here as a moderator. So we want uh, your comment on the salary increase. Yeah, I can, I can, I can. Let me use, uh, I think I can uh, either use my phone or I can, yeah, okay. Yeah. Go ahead and use your phone. 
Okay, you can go ahead. So, what do you want to hear now? Um, well, let me let, a, let let the moderator uh, ask a question, please. Okay, yeah, Mr. Yeah, Yala, go ahead. Mr. Yala, we were just briefly uh, we discussed this topic last weekend. Uh, we just wanted to revisit it uh, one more time just to make some clarifications. Um, uh, Dr. Conte also came up with new numbers. Um, he has been breaking this down for all of us to understand. Um, the Gambia government proposed a salary increase uh, to go effect in July. Um, um, but if you look at the numbers, uh, we are proposing that um, what they have on the table is not really uh, what we expect to see at this time. Uh, we were hoping that salary increases would not be across the board like the way it is, because in that way, it is just benefiting the very people at the top of the income ladder. And uh, if you look at basic economics, uh, if you look at the spending uh, pattern, uh, these people are not likely to uh, spend this money in the economy. Uh, many of them will probably stash it away in a local bank or somewhere, a foreign bank somewhere in the world. Um, it's going to definitely not going to affect the uh, uh, benefit the economy that much. Um, I would definitely see an increase in the salary of uh, those people at the bottom of the income ladder, like teachers, the nurses, uh, government drivers, uh, people like that. Uh, those people will directly use this money. Uh, they will spend it directly on their families, on their households, to increase, to improve their living standard, living condition. The money will be, uh, if I may use a typical uh, Gambian term, Gambian's term, uh, plowed back into the economy. And it might help expand the economy a little bit. Um, so that is something I would rather see than an across the board increase uh, in salaries this way. Uh, if you look at it like that, it basically just benefit, puts more money in the hands of those who do not need that money. Um, I remember these are the people who are rack, um, racking a lot of money from per diems and travel allowances and all that stuff that we don't need at this time. Face, the country facing uh, uh, extraordinary deficits, um, um, uh, budget deficits. Uh, this is potentially going to add to the inflation. Uh, this is potentially going to add to rising prices in the country. Um, I would, I wouldn't mind if the increase in salaries is, an, is not only focused to um, to um, adjust for um, inflation. Uh, that is understandable. But if you look at the government price uh, salary increases, um, you know what also happens is the private sector is going to follow suit with this, or the private sector is going to be left out of this. Um, if the government had in, um, uh, increased the minimum salary, minimum wage, um, it would have been a, probably a different story. And that would be across the board for all workers, you know, government and private and the private sector equally. Yeah, I, are you hearing me? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, do you want me to, do you want my inter intervention now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a very critical topic. Um, it's very topical. I can I, I if I could say, um, yeah, yeah. There is a there is a there is a there is an implication on salary increase across the board. But also we have to put also the underliers that if you also want to increase salary, you always try to put into into context whether the economy. Uh, whether whether the economy is registering real real growth. When we talk about real growth, we need to talk about the real wages and higher pays. So we need to understand whether uh, because there is always the need to look at the correlation of whether there is an economic growth over a period of time, and then we could also realize that from 2016 to 2021, uh, there has been a minimal growth, but also the economy has also has to, has fell by around 0.2 percent compared to previous years, that is 2019, if you compare 2019 and 2020 and 2021. So now, if you look at the weighted average that have been computed by Dr. Conte, that's really alarming. So uh, I, I myself have not been privy with information to compute and see what actually are the outliers or what is triggering those things, but 215, 255 increase on a weighted average of a salary, that's really on the high side. 
But when you're looking at the salary increase, you look at a you look at a minimal average, and it's sustainable. And then when we talk about issues of salary increase, the implication of salary increase across the board salary, because here salary increase also comes into clear because human resources or human relations, especially in healthcare or employee compensation, this is not all about economics. It also has an other layer of human interaction, human relationship. It has to talk about employee compensation. It has to trigger on employees' performance. But there are two things that you look at the theories that you need to look at from this perspective. There are those who perceive themselves as the high performance, you know, because they are also putting greater effort to, uh, if they felt on on, on on compensated. For instance, uh, what you have suggested, if you also say that from grade one to grade nine should be compensated, or their salary should be increased and not those from grade 10 to grade 12. So how about if you also have grade 10 to grade 12 that are high performance? If they have felt like, like that their performance have not been compensated, uh, are you not demotivating them to give the extra uh, efforts that they need? Because they're also at the top layer of government, you know? And there are also those who feel a bit on compensation because they're also related to those feelings on, you know, they have not been equitably compensated because they also, they are also there, the, the, there is also the, the, from there you also see the anticipation whereby there will be a reduction in their job performance during the coming years, and because they will, and then you also have you will tend to even perceive a deterioration in association between performance and compensation, because there must be a relationship between performance and compensation. And now in the in the in the government context, the government economy, when you increase a salary. You are also you are also opening a floor gate, whereby the people that have been compensated based on salary increase they are going to be the victims, because now inflation is going to increase, prices and products are going to be high, you know institutions are not going to suffer, but individuals that have been paid higher, so you go to the market still you will see if prices will increase because, for instance, if a salary increases that doesn't mean that the prices will go down. Automatically, the, the, the prices will skyrocket. And that's not good for the economy, and that's not good for the average Gambia, especially the poor public uh, servant. So now, uh, property owners, you know their impacts, the negative impacts that salary increase has. Now, property owners will increase the cost of rent. The cost of rent will go up, will, they will inflate the price. And now who's going to suffer? If the average owner who has been compensated, because even though you've been compensated, but that compensation, if you complete, if you complete that, there will be almost a percentage that will go to your to your payment, and that is a negative consequences that's going to have on your on your finances. So when we talk about our salary increase, uh, we need to understand. It. I know government want to do something, but I think a salary increase there must be a relationship of the economic growth, and then you also look at. What is also on the economy and also you look at prices and stuff like that so if you increase it goes with economic realities but you don't only increase based on only increase because you want to increase so now where is the money going to come from so you are going to make you are going to uh, you are going to constrain or contract other sectors because of the salary increase so what does that tell you is that you go is going to trigger a negative impact on the economy to buy 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 and light and that's not good so I will stop from there. If you have further questions, then I'll be able to interject and then I'll provide my intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jalo. Uh, very well said. Uh, appreciate uh, that input. Um, also, what we what we also need to um, recognize is that um, if you look at the salary structure in the Gambia, um, the uh, the average minimum salary uh, is like um, uh, sixteen thousand, according to some uh, some data. And the average maximum salary uh, is um, around seventy-one thousand. And um, I think these are these are reported as monthly. Uh, but I am hundred percent sure. I am very certain that uh, the minimum salary, in actual fact, is much lower than sixteen thousand. Um, you know, eight thousand uh, has been reported. Um, uh, even less than that. Uh, so, in my view, uh, there is wide disparity, and of course, the minute, the maximum two is a lot, lot bigger than seventy-one thousand. 
Um, so um, the actual disparity in terms of inequality of income, I mean, is, is very apparent uh, in Gambia. And I'm not, you know, nobody's arguing that uh, there should be equality. Uh, equality is impossible uh, in an economic situation. Uh, inequality to some extent um, is okay as long as everybody is being lifted um, up a little bit uh, over time. Um, as economies expand, uh, inequality tends to uh, increase, but uh, overall, everybody's condition improves. Now, what we have in the Gambia is that a lot of the people uh, on the lower end of the income, what they're getting is not a living wage, is, is, is a paycheck to poverty. Um, so um, that is what government needs to focus on. Uh, try to improve the lot of those people at the very bottom um, to a point where they can be able to sustain themselves and their families. And this is what overall will benefit the economy. Um, so my, my concern would be uh, that. Um, and with that, uh, unless Dr. Conte or Dr. Gallo wants to come in again and say something on this, I want to move on to... Yeah, I, can, I just want to intervene. I want to interject from there. I, I don't know. Uh, in the government context, uh, it's been a while that I have not checked on issues like uh, uh, what is the minimum salary. But I, if I could, if I am hearing you well, you have stated that there, is, uh, there are people that earn 8000 a year. Yeah. Is it right? No, monthly. Huh? I think the data is about I, monthly. I mean the, I mean the minimum, the, the, the minimum, uh, the minimum aid rate. Because uh, how much does uh, are, people, are still people who earn in one thousand three hundred or one thousand five hundred? Because at the end of the year, uh, deep, uh, there are people that earn less than twenty four thousand a year. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's really concern. And I understand, but now you also look at the dynamics of the global economy. Whether we like it or not, there we we will see an increase in salary because there is always there is the need for an increase in pay because inflation is going to get higher. And then the issue is how do you contain inflation? You need to work on your economy and see how best because the Gambia is an, you know, it's not an exporting nation. Depend most, we depend most of everything is been imported. And that has, a, that has a negative impact on the economy because prices will keep going on. And now if the government also does not increase the salaries of employees, people will continue suffering because for instance, even now, as of now, if you are earning uh, 4,000 a month, and now a bag of a rice costs two thousand, and then uh, now we are in twenty twenty two. Now it has increased to almost uh, 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 zero point zero two, which is going to cost almost about one to two thousand two hundred. And now, if you if an employer happens not to be uh, not to receive a, 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 an, an, an increase in pay for twenty twenty three, so do you do you, do you, are we seeing the effects that is going to happen that uh, employee? So it's going to trigger whereby low performance will go down because it's going to impact negatively on their morale and their motivation. And for that instance, it will also lead to people uh, looking at other areas of trying to have side incomes and leaving their government jobs, and which is going to have a negative impact on productivity and performance. And then the third effects that it's going to have is going to, is going to encourage corruption and corrupt practices. Because now you have realized that you earn 4000 and now uh, your expenses now supersedes that 4000 So what are you going to do? You're going to look for an opportunity. And then an opportunity will strike out when there, there is a Goldman opportunity that strike out, you'll go for it. So now the issue is the, uh, the personnel management office should have sat over a period of time. Example like, you know, at any, any given year as a serious government, you know, uh, and especially experts, it's not about the serious government, but people that work in government, public sector, will always put this into consideration. We understand the Gambia is a resource constrained country, but notwithstanding, because we understand that we depend on budget support. And then our official, what have been triggered, that diaspora contributes immensely uh, to the economy of the Gambia, that, is, that, that tells you something. So what we would want to, what is anticipated or what is expected of us as, as our Gambians, especially people that are in top government of uh, positions, what they could have done was to constant review. Every quarterly day should be reviewing and also putting the, the, the economic dynamics, aligning it to the global economy. And looking at things, whenever the global economy suffers, it will trickle down on the government economy. So now, how do you, how do you caution in 
How do you question in bringing in strategies so that your people, employees that are working in the public sector or private sector, do not uh, feel the uh, the brain to not extend? We know we cannot take, we cannot contain everything, but at least minimal, so that minimal damage could have been done or something could have been avoided. So now the onus lies on the responsibilities of people that are given that responsibility to make sure that they sit, they have that ideas, they vision in and try to have to and captivate certain things into the economy. But also you need to understand that that economy is not static. It has to be organic. It has to be moving and it has to be evolving. But now, these are now times that really calls for people, especially the government, to be in, in, investing in productive sectors because it's concerning and it's worrying. Otherwise, things will continue like that and people will be poorer and poorer because we are going to be worse off than we were 20 years ago. And that's really concerning. So I will stop from here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jalo. Dr. Conte? No. Okay. All right. So thank you, guys. Uh, we're going to move on to um, um, the next uh, point we want to talk about, and that is the uh, regional integration, uh, uh, trade between Senegal and the Gambia. Um, uh, the Gambia and Senegal are neighbors. Uh, actually, we are, are very intertwined neighbors. Uh, the Gambia is sitting right inside Senegal. Uh, surrounded by Senegal on three sides, except on the west, which is on the which opens into the Atlantic also. Um, so, and politically, Senegal has been interested in the Gambia uh, since independence, has always been interested in the Gambia. Um, um, Senegal always wanted to exert some influence, or some control on Gambia's economic and political life uh, uh, since uh, since independence. Um, and uh, what I intend to do here is not really to provide us uh, much of a data-based analysis, but rather uh, more of a perceptual uh, analysis. Um, recently, Gambians um, have been concerned about the economic um, situation in the country. And I've listened to uh, people after people uh, some extent, um, uh, a portion in blame to Gambia's relationship with Senegal. Um, um, the influx of Senegalese goods into the Gambia, um, which basically just means Gambia is importing more and more from Senegal rather than exporting. Um, uh, the concern about um, Senegalese government's control over Gambia government, uh, we know from the um, political change in 2017, Senegal played a crucial role. Just, just like it happened in 1981, uh, Senegal came to the rescue of Gambia again. And uh, this rescue in 2017 um, positioned Senegal um, um, in a situation where it has some degree of leverage on the Gambia government. Um, uh, many Gambians argue that Senegal has political control uh, of uh, uh, the decisions that our, our government makes. Um, I don't know how true this is, but um, um, I do understand that Senegal uh, has some leverage, has some um, uh, upper hand uh, in its dealings with, um, with the Gambia, partly because Gambia wants to be appreciative of Senegalese role in our political development um, since uh, 2017. Um, but again, uh, uh, just to focus a little bit on uh, trade between the two countries, uh, Gambia and Senegal has always traded, uh, even um, not formally, but informally also. Some, some um, reports indicate that despite the intertwinedness of Gambia and Senegal, uh, politically and economically, there is virtually no trade, no official trade between the two countries. But informal trade is pretty strong between the two countries, uh, which sometimes are not fully uh, captured in our uh, data, in our reporting. Uh, but again, uh, truth be told, Senegal and Gambia have traded. Um, uh, officially, there is some trade between the two countries. Um, actually, um, the trade between the two uh, the two countries um, have been growing for the past 24 years, I believe. And even though Senegal 
uh, Senegalese exports to the Gambia have far surpassed Gambia's exports to Senegal. Um, I think uh, some data uh, reported to be 1 to 24. Uh, Gambian exports versus Senegalese exports. Gambian exports to Senegal versus Senegalese exports to the Gambia is at the ratio of 1 to 24. So that is a huge disparity. And of course, we have to look at the barriers to trade between Gambia and Senegal, uh, which are there. Uh, but again, um, uh, some of the some of the reasons for these disparities is internal uh, constraints that uh, Gambia uh, internal constraints in the Gambia itself. Um, Gambia, um, we have lost on many fronts. Uh, we lost the entry port trade, and um, Gambia today trades more uh, with China and Brazil and India uh, than it does with Senegal. Um, and if you look at the uh, the trade um, uh, with these countries, Gambia con still continues to rely on importing raw pro primary products, raw materials, um, and importing all kind of manufactured products. Uh, this is a, this is a direct uh, pathway to poverty, sustained poverty. Um, so Gambia needs to, even with our trade with Senegal, um, what do we import import from Senegal? Uh, mostly foodstuffs. Uh, foodstuffs, Gambia's foodstuffs mostly come from Senegal. Um, so uh, we need to be very cognizant of these. And these are some, I don't think, um, production of these foodstuffs is cheaper in Senegal than it is in the Gambia. I think Gambia should be able to uh, transform its agriculture to be able to be a little bit more self-reliant uh, in food production. Um, but also other factors may be at play also. Um, Senegal, um, you know, obviously we have these currency issues with Senegal and uh, Gambia's uh, inflation and interest rates um, and other internal issues may also be defeating our ability to compete well with Senegal. Um, of course, there are trade barriers uh, between us. The port of Bandul is very constrained. Um, we know that. And I think there are projects on the way to expand the capacity of the port. Uh, but as we speak, it is very, very constrained. Um, there are also infra other infrastructural issues like roads and bridges. Uh, of course, the Senegambia bridge uh, helps a little bit, but um, there's still a lot of logistical issues. Uh, if you listen to the complaints of the Gambia Transport Union, uh, you can see some of the uh, some of the constraints uh, they are facing uh, in terms of uh, competing with uh, Senegal. Uh, Senegal's um, the inability to use um, uh, uh, the currency challenges between Gambia and Senegal. I'm sure Dr. Conte will talk a little bit about that. Uh, but all of those add up to uh, make it difficult difficult for the Gambia to compete uh, effectively in this job region. Um, I do want to see. Um, an integration, Gambia integrating into the sub-regional economy more and more, because I believe that Gambia, as small as it is, um, cannot really succeed without integrating into the sub-regional economy. And this will require an opening up on all sides, uh, Gambian side, Senegalese side, and other uh, players in the sub-regional economy. Um, all of them need to uh, dismantle these barriers to trade and the movement of people and goods uh, to transform the region into a single market. I know there are, uh, there are plans to, uh, to integrate the whole of Africa, I believe, as a single market and a single currency. Uh, but uh, the future of that really uh, also depend on how quickly uh, these regional blocks can integrate their economies. Um, um, also, there I believe uh, some of the constraints to uh, uh, to trade between Gambia and Senegal has to do with finance. 
um, the our banks and our credit unions. Um, uh, funding may still be uh, a problem. Um, so uh, all of those, I believe, uh, add up to uh, our constraints uh, in terms of trade. Uh, but Dr. Quanta, what I want to leave is that, um, you know, I don't want to give the impression that the Gambia immediately need to have um, 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 a, a positive balance of trade. I mean, a surplus. Uh, many countries are running deficits in uh, balance of trade. Uh, United States is one example. Uh, U.S. is um, is running a huge uh, deficit of uh, balance of trade annually. And but uh, U.S. is not in the same position as the Gambia. Uh, part of the reason U.S. is able to sustain and even um, um, how do I put it, uh, overcome the negative impact of these uh, negative balance of trade is because of the demand for the dollar um, around the world. Uh, even though U.S. is running a negative um, uh, balance of trade, uh, the uh, capital inflow of, uh, into the U.S. is much higher and it compensates for uh, this um, uh, trade deficit. Uh, so um, the Gambia does not have that kind of uh, benefit. Um, so um, a continued uh, negative balance of trade um, is something that the Gambia cannot work off, uh, cannot manage uh, effectively as the US is able to. Uh, so matter of fact, if you look at, uh, uh, besides China and Brazil and um, India, the Gambia trade with U.S. too, and most of the most of the Gambia's uh, exports to the U.S. is uh, uh, kind of foodstuff and um, uh, textiles, I believe. Uh, but if you look at the trade uh, ratio between the Gambia and U.S., is I think it's one to one hundred and seventy. So you uh, Gambia imports way, 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 170 times more than they export to U.S. So, um, I mean, we were just talking about the salary increases in the country. And, you know, it is partly related to this as well. Um, um, in a country where we still continue to depend on importing all kind of manufactured uh, products, we only uh, export uh, primary products. Uh, raw materials, um, even a job creation uh, is very limited. Um, the U.S. is talking about 3% uh, unemployment rate. Uh, under, I believe the recent one is under 4%. That be how, what is the employment rate we talk about, 60 something or what, if formally? Um, um, you know, it's, 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 it's just, it's, um, you know, apart from the, the, the figures, Gambia, we need to, there are a lot of sentiments in the country that the Gambia is losing out to Senegal uh, on the, in the economic front. Um, somebody was vacationing in Gambia. Uh, one of my friends uh, is in the Gambia vacationing there. I had him talking about uh, even our advertising companies now are more going to Senegalese companies than Gambian companies. Uh, you see more and more of Senegalese companies running ads about about Gambian Gambian businesses in the country. Um, so, you know, which I don't really have a big problem with that. If the region is integrated, uh, Gambia and Senegal should definitely operate as one country. Um, I mean, there should be free movement of people. Uh, Gambia should be able to get employment in the in the Senegal, just as Senegalese should be able to get employment in the in the Gambia, um, you know, uh, we can have one, uh, two countries using, I mean, one country using two different systems, but um, I have no problem with that. But this adds to the perception of most Gambians that there is this huge presence, uh, if I may say, uh, overtake of the Gambia by Senegal. And 
you know, uh, we need to uh, cut down that um, that uh, situation a little bit because uh, most Gambians might be beginning to think, if I may use Trump Trump's words, uh, that in the long run they may not even have a country anymore. <laughs> I do not mean to sensationalize, sensationalize these, but that's what Trump has been saying vis -a -vis with regards to immigration. He said, <laughs> he said if we don't uh, build a wall, we won't have a country anymore. So but that is that is Trump. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't apply in this case. But the perception is there by ordinary Gambians that um, uh, we are losing out to Senegal. We are losing the competition uh, with Senegal uh, in terms of trade, uh, in terms of the economy. Uh, I think I'm going to stop here, Dr. Conte, Dr. Diallo. What do you guys think about this? Uh, go ahead, Dr. Conte. No, you go ahead. You go ahead. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Dada. Uh, I think you have uh, raised, uh, you have brought in a very topical and a very critical uh, 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 topic to discuss when it comes to regional integration. I, uh, you know, regional integration. Uh, we look at the, its importance cannot be overemphasized, particularly to two countries that share uh, uh, the same culture and tradition and belief system. Uh, for example, Gambia and Senegal, which is very unique, and I. Uh, I would I will start from where you you end like competition. The Gambia is losing competition. Yeah, the Gambia has been losing competition. But to me, from an, an economic perspective or from a finance perspective, competition is good between. Uh, but uh, competition is good between two countries. But when it comes to competition in uh, and then looking at uh, attracting foreign direct investment and also encouraging you know uh, domestic uh, uh, investment or investors, I think uh, also when it comes to regional integration. And then establishing relationship with uh, foreign country, particularly in, with Senegal, uh, language also plays a part. But I also think like people that negotiate on the Gambian, uh, on the Gambian, on the Gambian, uh, on the Gambian side, should be very witty, should be smart, and be very persuasive. Because you know, when you have a very good negotiation skills, it helps you out on what you put on the table. And then uh, from that perspective, we also need to understand, we need to put into context the historical genesis of regional integration or the Gambia, or the Gambia uh, relationship when it comes to Senegal, in, you know, re when it comes to integration. You know, uh, then we need to look at where we have been losing. So where we have been losing or where we have been caught short. So how were we able to go back and review and see where we didn't do well? And then try to come back and people that are going to negotiate so that we can build up people. You know, when you are building, you build institutions and then you bring in people that have the necessary way of will that can negotiate on your behalf. Because the people, the negotiators, uh, is just like a lobbyist. A negotiator is just like a lobbyist. You need to be very, very smart and intelligent. Because you work on policies, but your policies should be anchored on your economic realities. And then you also need to, need to make sure that you also vision that policy on your government, on, on, on your country's development pedestal. So now, putting into consideration that, of recent, uh, even you look at all what Senegal have benefited, the Gambia has started all of these policies. All of these policies were designed and developed in the Gambia. But most of these things were developed and designed in the Gambia, or they were discussed in the Gambia, but other countries, you know, uh, take it from the government because we couldn't continue doing it because the issue is we are very good at initiating. But the issue is when it comes to, you know, harnessing resources and then seeing best how best we can attract and how best we can, you know, approach some of these funds and how best we can utilize and implement all of these plans, that's where the problem is. And then that's where we start putting corners. Because uh, of recent you have seen Senegal emergence with Makassar's government. You know, they've been doing you know, remarkably well. And that tells you Senegal have a vision and they're pursuing on their, their vision. The Gambia has a vision. The National Development Plan has a vision. And it's ambitious. It's very optimistic. It is time bound. It is realistic. It is achievable. But uh, the implementation, that's where the problem is. And when it comes to the problem of implementation, it should be triggered on, on what level. And at what level have, are we now on stages? So now, if you look at the uh, the Senegal, you look at Senegal now. They have they have been uh, they have been doing ports expansion and ports development. They get it in uh, they get it in uh, in Kaulak. They get it in Kasmas, and now they are moving into a new port 
there is going to be the port of Ngayan. So if you look at the port of Ngayan of Senegal recently, which is, which is almost about 837 million dollar investment. And the construction is going to take almost about four years period. You know, and then it's going to have almost about two posts on a max vessel handling. And government is going to hold almost about 40% of equity on that development, in that venture. And then they're going to have probably going to have like a training center on the port and the logistics to be constructed. You see how creative Senegal is. And then you also look at the benefit that the local market or the local women are going to have in the surrounding villages of Yenin, Tuba, Tuba, Jalol, and Pompuge. You know, they're going to benefit immediately in formal training on renewable energy, you know, production for their communities. And it's going to create jobs during the phase of the project development from 25 to more than 100,000 upon completion. This is what we talk about project implementation. This is all what we talk about project planning. This is all what we talk about project assessment. So in the government context, this is what is lacking. We see that in a but the issue is people that matters most are not given the responsibilities. They're not given the, the, the ones so that they can spearhead some of these projects. We have people, we have competent people that are in the in the country that could man all of those things. But now we go into the negotiation, we get certain things. But now we have what we call misplaced priorities. Instead of putting it where it's supposed to be, we tend to put it deflected into all areas that are not even critical to the economy, that does not even contribute nothing to the economy. So now we need to prioritize our resources and see what we because we are losing. And competition is good, but when you are losing your economic grip to a level, it's concerning. And now I'll go back to where you also started earlier on when it comes to our goods are not they are, they are not penetrating Senegal. It doesn't have to do with the good penetrating in Senegal. We have ECOWAS protocol. And then we have the IRIST. You know, we have the internal trade in Senegal. And then we trade with that goods come Senegal very more into Gambia. But still now, size comes. And the Senegal market is more dynamic. Senegal has more population, population and it also has invested into manufacturing. Into, you know, so this is also what it, the one tells when it comes to the country invest in manufacturing. So the Gambia also should also look at the design and try to go back to the drawing board and see where we got it wrong. As I said, I so now, the issue is it's good for Gambia. Now, what matters most is how Gambia, as we said earlier, how Gambia can be Now, since Senegal is expanding on the government, what we need to do is to build a network of ports in the Senegambia region, which is the critical. Because now, what the Gambia should be trying to think about is to make sure that we can also, you know, expand on our time. What is going to be in Senegal? We need to look at what in in our we need to look at one in Basse, which is going to be critical. It's going to be an, an you know, an handling site for countries, especially like a landlocked country like Mali. You know, because it's easier for Mali to come through Gambia than going to Senegal, you know, pass through that matter road of almost about 500 kilometers, because they're born to fuel and also the wear and tear of their of their vehicle put into consideration. It's a cost, so it's easier for Malian to come in, you know, unload a fuel and, and, and take a fuel and, and take it to Mali. In Gambia. So Gambia should harness that resource. We get it. The Gambia is most strategic than Senegal. We are competing. We are in a competition hall. Either we are Senegal is a neighbor and we share a lot, Senegal will out at Gambia and Senegal will do whatever it takes to out at Gambia in, in the world of trade and international relations. So we need to go back and see where we got it wrong and try to learn lessons and improve on those things. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jalo. Very well said. I think it, this should be clear to our, our Gambians, uh, our Gambian government that uh, Senegal is a neighbor, Senegal is a friend, uh, Senegal, we are appreciative of Senegalese role uh, in stabilizing our country uh, during our time of crisis. Uh, but we also have to remember that Senegal is a competitor. Of uh, we compete with Senegal. Uh, which is a positive thing. Um, 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 competition brings uh, makes all of us better. Um, um, competition through trade um, helps us focus on our comparative advantages uh, and become 
better at what we do uh, uniquely uh, to leverage that um, uh, to create uh, prosperity for our people. Um, so we have to be uh, very, Gambia has to be very aware of that. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, it looks like um, the, uh, based on the evidence we're getting from the people, uh, is that the Gambian people do not feel like uh, we are uh, making the best of our relationship with Senegal uh, in terms of um, standing up for the interests of our people. Uh, even if you look at um, um, uh, Gambians, um, wealthy Gambians uh, investing in Senegal, uh, probably moving their money out of the country and um, starting it away in Senegal um, and uh, investing real estate and other things in Senegal is much, much higher than the other way around. I don't mean the ordinary citizens, I mean, uh, but if you look at the civil servants, government, uh, senior government officials who are investing in real estate in Senegal um, and um, uh, stressing away bank accounts in Senegal, uh, moving money away, um, it's a lot more than the, than the other way around. Uh, so you will, um, no matter what front you look at, uh, basically you come to one conclusion. Uh, the influx into Senegal uh, from the Gambia. Um, so, um, you know, we are not saying these things should not happen. Uh, in a normal situation, the Gambia and Senegal are really getting integrated. Uh, and we should integrate our economies. Uh, but it should be a uniform integration. It should be an all-round integration. Uh, what we do have right now is that uh, the Gambia is losing out. Uh, in the in the uh, uh, in a competition with Senegal, uh, so we need to. That is the situation. I think the uh, a lot of the Gambian people are uh, are saying um, there's some evidence in the data uh, that I have been able to look at uh, to support this perception. Um, so. Uh, we only hope that the relevant authorities will do. And I went to the Ministry of Trade's website. Virtually, you can't, there's no data. You can't find anything um, there, basically. I think all, all I could say see there is um, uh, validation workshops and uh, uh, stra policy strategy stuff. It's mainly about speeches and, you know, all that. There's hardly any data or anything that, can be uh, relevant to anybody. Uh, so, um, um, uh, and in full disclosure, the minister is a classmate of mine, um, a very good guy, very upright person. I have no doubt in his capabilities and his intent for the country. Um, you know, but uh, they keep saying that uh, there's this saying in the business world that. Um, uh, they are the uh, uh, individual, the group, and the context, right? The the the, the situation. So uh, we have a situation in our government and our country that uh, a lot of time constrain all of us. Uh, so we have to be cognizant of that as well. Uh, but um, Dr. Conte, what we are arguing is that if we look at the perception in the country. Uh, if you talk to the ordinary people, and I've watched reporters go to the uh, streets and interview Gambians, ordinary Gambians, and I listen to most of what they are saying, um, it seems to corroborate or um, confirm the, the fact that there is widespread perception that um, Gambia is losing out to Senegal uh, in terms of uh, trade, in terms of the economy, um, and uh, the influx of Senegalese goods and Senegalese, Senegalese presence, overwhelming Senegalese presence in our economy, um, uh, is it's not balanced uh, by uh, the Gambia's um, uh, the Gambia's presence uh, in the Senegalese economy. In short, the Gambia is losing out in its relationship uh, with Senegal. Um, 
you know, uh, we don't have to make this political. This is purely economics. Uh, we need to leverage the Gambia, our relationship with Senegal, in a way that also benefits Gambian people. Uh, to dispel this uh, perception that the country is not doing enough to, um, um, to I mean, defend Gambian resources uh, for the benefit of the Gambian people. Dr. Conte. Well, um, thank you. Um, this actually goes back to our history lessons um, or classes about colonial uh, colonialism, the direct and indirect rule that the British had indirect rule and the French had uh, direct rule. And I used to remember a slogan to say, give me political uh, freedom. So a country of 66 million, which is France, still dominates 29 French-speaking countries in, in, in Africa. When it comes to uh, central banks, I believe with the exception of Guinea, Conakry, uh, no French-speaking African country has their own central bank. And uh, so which means that Senegal and other speak French-speaking countries cannot make economic decisions until they consult their colonial masters. That being the case, when we uh, trade in SAFA, we are helping France because Senegal still pays taxes to, to, to France. I was fortunate to uh, talk to a good friend of mine that I will not disclose, a member of a central bank of an English speaking country told me that anytime uh, they have meetings with French speaking Africa, or West African countries, they come as a block. So meaning that uh, they all agree on one principle and they, and then they, they would always tell them, if you're gonna do that, you're only gonna have one vote. So again, uh, I do believe that, uh, you know, the young guy who uh, ran for president in uh, Senegal, uh, Mr. Sonko, Usman Sonko, talked about French domination. If you go to Dakar, most of the shops are owned by are owned by French French people, so uh, French citizens. So this has been the case, and we have talked about having a unified uh, currency. Uh, it was supposed to take place. Was it last year or a, a year before? And if and uh, the French speaking countries in West Africa came up with another name, Eco, that was not even uh, uh, approved by 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 the organization so as a result of that that has created some uh problems for us in our uh i'm online can i can i can you come back in about 10 minutes well, I just leave the thing here that you can drop in the toilet okay yeah leave it there please thank you uh, so as a result, sorry about that. Uh huh. So as a result of that, there is no way we can compete with 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 Senegal. I experienced one thing when I was traveling with some Gambians. Uh, at uh, when we left uh, Hamdalai, going through Kara, there is a police uh, a checkpoint right at uh, after Kara. Uh, is this Okoni or somewhere? And those uh, officers were very disrespectful to us. And the sooner they asked for IDs, when I pull out my U.S. passport, they treated me differently. And I was shocked to say, "Here, I am a Gambian. Without my ID, I was disrespected." But when I pull out a U.S. passport, it was a different story. So I, I want you to help me here. Can you tell me the percentage of Gambians who went to Senegal to get a job at a private company? But likewise, what is happening in our country now, like QTV and other businesses, 
The Senegalese are controlling every aspect of our economy. You will know that until after the Tabaski uh, 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 festivities or uh, during the Tabaski festivities when people have to uh, drive to go home. Uh, last time I was in the Gambia in 2019, the whole of KMC was deserted. It was as if you just drove everybody away. So we need to have respect in dealing with uh, our Senegalese uh, brothers and sisters. They cannot disrespect us. Because when you go to Senegal, they will tell you that you country, you, we don't have anything. And let me also uh, touch on something that we Gambians need to look at seriously. And this has been happening for a long time. When people used to say that, oh, they get all these fruits and vegetables from Senegal. No. Most of the Senegalese merchants who are driving Senegalese vehicles, they come to Gambia to go to the gardens, vegetable gardens, to buy their stuff. And they would not want you to pay them in Gambian Dalasi. That's a disrespect. If our functional currency is the Gambian Dalasi, why should Senegalese be asking us to pay them in SAFA? Because if I go to Senegal, they will not accept me to pay them in Dalasi. But why would they be asking me for SAFA? If you don't believe me, go to Tanje or go to Gunjur. At the seaside over there, most of the most of the fisher, fishermen who uh, frequent those places, they wouldn't want to be paid in Gambian Dalasi, but Senegal is uh, for the SAFA. And the SAFA is not actually owned by Senegal, it's owned by what? Uh, 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 France. Another another concerning thing that I have with the disrespect of our own selves is the frequent invitation of Senegalese artists to the Gambia. I listen to Senegalese songs and I compare them with the Gambian songs. I couldn't find any significant difference. The last time this Wally said came, tell me whether his performance was better than any other Gambian performer. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, how much money did he leave with? The question here is that if we can go to the market and harass the, uh, the, 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 the average vendor, a female vendor to pay five, ten dollars a day, how come we have Senegalese uh, artists coming in to perform in our country and not paying taxes? I would like also to know uh, that um, that area of uh, of of the where they perform is in uh, is in uh, in West Coast region. I would like the government to assess maybe even five percent tax for even going to roads or schools. Do we benefit from that? Yeah, they can come, but they are not going to go with one hundred percent of their loot. So here we have we are cash constrained when it comes to revenue in our country. The Senegalese are taking advantage of our kindness. So I think, I hope, yeah, Senegal, we want to thank you for coming to our defense during the impact, which I, don't, I felt that uh, even the President Adam Barrow should not even have left the Gambia. He should have stayed there because Halifa Salah stayed there and nothing happened to him. So what would the problem here we have in the Gambia is that the Senegalese don't respect us. And I, when people tell me we are brothers and sisters, yeah, we can be brothers and sisters if you give me due respect. But if you don't give me respect, I will tell you, because it used to be on the Sardar's government, the Gambia used to re-export re, re uh, goods to Mali. Uh, the Gambia uh, Transport Union has always said how difficult Gambian uh, drivers uh, and what the difficulties that Gambian drivers encounter when they uh, get into Senegal. But look at what is happening with the economic forces, where the economic forces can turn around and seize a vehicle with uh, uh, and their cargo only to be sent to Senegal. So these are things that we need to discuss about. Uh, but if not, nothing is going to happen. My other area of concern is the ability for the Gambia Ports Authority to start strategizing in building uh, more uh, more ports. If Senegal, according to Dr. Uh, uh, Jalo, 
is going out there building more uh, ports in, in, in Senegal uh, what, and customers. Why can't we do the same thing? Gunjur should be an area of attraction. We cannot solely put every hope on Banjo because Banjo is only one way in by the road and the other by sea. And the sand mining that is happening right at the entrance of, uh, of Denton Brick, in the, run, run, in the long run, it may uh, eventually affect the safety of the bridge. So my recommendation will be for the Gambia Ports Authority to try to find alternative ports in our country because Senegal is trying to uh, try to put a rope on our neck. Then the only thing that we have look at Gambians. What look at what is happening? Gambians now are uh, importing their goods to Senegal, and then they go out there and pick it up, pick pick them and bring them to the Gambia. So uh, Brufu should be, uh, Gunjo should be an area that, you know, the Gambia Ports Authority should look at as a venture. For the life of me, we have the other half of the country in the North Bank. Does it make any sense for a truck, to, for, a, for a vessel to come that cannot go to Barra if we have a port there? I also would like to know, uh, why can't we have dry ports somewhere in Yolutenda, Bambatenda? Why can't we have dry ports in uh, in Kaur and Kuntaur? And finally, Basse. Uh, let's go back to the history of the Gambia and how the British were more interested in, uh, in the Gambia. And they were only interested in getting only 12 kilometers, if I'm not, 12 miles uh, from the sea. To the coast of the Gambia, to the to the uh, to the border of the Gambia and Senegal. Of course, you all know that Gambia extended all the way to Zigan Shore. That could have been Gambia. Siliti, all those areas would have been Gambia. So we never define our boundaries, and now they are all part of Senegal. So again, uh, I know that it is a good idea to have regional integration. Regional integration, when you're dealing with French-speaking West African countries. They are only doing, they only act with the permission from France. So look at, look at the, look at the, look at the uh, medical tourists that go to Senegal. I will, does the government even have a record of Gambians who travel to Dakar for treatment and how long they, when they came back, they leave? So uh, to be quite candid, everybody gives credit to Senegal. For, for saying that they have all these uh, uh, nice uh, clinics and so forth. Their clinics are not better than Gambia's. What, what they really have, you know, is they have the, uh, the doctors that fly from France, from Paris, to come to Senegal for, to, to treat patients. Because as you, you, if you notice, you can take a flight from, from, uh, from, from, from Paris to, to Senegal less than, what, five, six hours? So maybe we should try to have the same protocol with the English speak with with United Kingdom, and if not, if we cannot do that, we need to look at uh, Ireland. Uh, Mr. Lamin uh, P. S. Stanley was here, and he just left. He was saying that um, the uh, the Gambia uh, needs to engage uh, the Irish government because the Irish government has allocated. Uh, 200 some million or I don't, I, you know he has to tell me the exact number but the Irish government has allocated that to uh, uh, English speaking countries and uh, we don't even have an embassy in Ireland so we all tend to look at the United Kingdom look at what is happening with the visa stuff that uh, the, the 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 UK government is trying to impose on us so again trying to say that they have to increase the fees so in my view, uh, I believe that we can be neighbors, but let's take a look at our long, the long-term effect of what Senegal is doing. If they're building all these ports, will Banjo be vital for importation or, export, uh, or uh, exporting? So this is one area that we really need to sit and, uh, and, and, and discuss about, uh, about it. We cannot just say that because we are neighbors. So we are brothers and sisters. Yeah, you can be neighbors with someone, but you can only be neighbors if they respect your 
uh, your, your confinement. In my view, Senegal is getting whatever it wants from Gambia, and the Gambia cannot get what it wants from Senegal. I stop right there. Thank you, Dr. Conte. Very well said. Uh, much appreciation. And again, we wanted to emphasize that um, this is government to government. We are not talking about individual Gambian and Senegalese citizens. Uh, Gambia and Senegal have been one people, um, one traditions, uh, uh, one value systems. Um, so Gambians and Senegalese should be able to uh, move in and out of each other's country uh, uh, freely. Um, Gambians and Senegalese should be able to go to either country and go to school there, uh, find employment there, uh, make a home there um, uh, freely. Uh, that's the kind of integration we hope uh, between the Gambia and Senegal as an example, as a model actually for West Africa and the whole of uh, continental Africa. Um, um, but in the event that we still do not have a full integration um, of the two economies, uh, it is the Gambia government's duty to stand up for the interests of the Gambia um, when it comes to trade with Senegal, when it comes to economic interaction with Senegal. Um, and that is, that is the point we are trying to make. Um, um, this is not just about Senegalese and Gambian citizens who uh, move across borders uh, to do uh, business or to go to school or find employment uh, or just relocate, um, make a different home uh, for themselves. The two, re the two countries should try to integrate into a single economy. Uh, but again, like we said, we have highlighted challenges uh, that continue to be, uh, to make this impossible. Uh, so we are all cognizant of this, but I hope uh, that over time those barriers can be overcome. Uh, Dr. Conte, I wanted us to... Um, I Can I keep in? I want to add something. Absolutely, yes. Dr. Jala, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I think Dr. Conte's uh, intervention was very critical. To me, yes. uh, he has stated so many things, and I... I uh, I don't have an issue with economic migration because I think every country goes through that. Because even for us in the West, we also migrated to the uh, to the to the to the US for uh, economic uh, or other political you know uh, reasons. And the issue is I don't want us to go wherever we drive to an age where what we we lead to what we call economic nationalism, and the Gambia cannot afford that because those ones have consequences on the economy and it also have consequences on on the lives and livelihood of Gambians. Because uh, looking at our market size is very small, and then when we are in a global trade and competition, which is very key, I think uh, one thing that is very fundamental is that invest we need to understand that investment is driven through uh, so many salient factors. One, it has to do with market attractiveness. It has to do on the size of the market, the population, and it has to also do with the content and the characters of people that are out there, and also has to do with the features of that individuals. So the issue is we have to go back to the drawing board and understand what are our economic policies, what are our trade policies, what does the Gambia benefit between Gambia and Senegal and other uh, countries within the sub-region. Because if you look at the Gambia, it's a, it's, it's a melting pot for countries that are within the sub-region that came in and they settled in and they were successful. And then the issue is we shouldn't be thinking of economic nationalism because once we start thinking economic nationalism, well, what has triggered in South Africa will come to Gambia. And we don't want to go into that line because that is a travesty on democracy. That is a travesty on good governance. And that is a travesty on good neighborliness. So the issue is the Gambia is losing out and it's losing out big. Well, because uh, the, Gambia has to, uh, the Gambia has tended itself to pursue what we call market capitalism. So we don't have nobody to blame but those who are there pursuing those kind of policies. So what is anticipated is that for those people, I'm a social democrat, and I'm somebody who does not believe in market capitalism. I have my reservation. But notwithstanding, when I see market capitalism is something that people can also go in, I can chip it and put in my intervention. If the Gambia want to make sure that they are very serious when it comes to market capitalism, they need to uh, you know, enhance uh, even the public-private partnership. But the public-private partnership will also be anchored on government. Because, for example, we have what we call the economic vultures, agents of economic looters. 
you know, these are economic looters that are out there in the private sector. That's where these are people that will always grease people's hands in the public sector to give them opportunities so that they can exploit those resources. So we have to be very cognizant of the fact that there are so many people out there who do not understand what, the, what it takes to run an economy. But they are only focused on something that benefits them, something that greases their oil, and something that benefits to build their stomach infrastructure. And that is not what we are talking about. When it comes to Gambia, Gambia matters. And the issue is, even if now, if when it comes to Britain, two different countries, these are economics. We can talk about the different economic policies that are out there, and then we can see how Gambia can leverage the opportunity and see because based on our strategic, uh, our strategic location. So now when it comes to individual choices and stuff like the private sector, uh, they have uh, they are at liberty to employ people, but there are three factors that put into consideration. People want to be having a competitive edge based on trying to employ people that have the talents, that have the capability, that have the skills, that have the competence, that have the experience, and that have the knowledge. So when it comes to Gambia, when it comes to technical skills, that we are, we are lacking behind, and Senegal has already out in Gambia in that aspect. And you can talk about everything Senegal has out at Gambia into all of those things. So the issue is we have to humble ourselves and learn, even though we understand we are two different countries, to uh, you know, even having the same culture, we are interrelated, but notwithstanding, this is not about individuals. I might have a grandfather that comes from Futa Toro. That doesn't mean that I have to uh, uh, gravitate towards Futa Toro. I'm a Gambian. So my priority should be Gambian, but I should not take that Gambian to the context whereby I'll be very you know, public, to the extent whereby I will try to portray economic, you know, nationalism. So I, I'm, I'm not going into that. Now the onus lies on our responsibilities. What do we want as Gambians? And where do we want to make sure that we are going to be competitive and then we can attract investors? So that we can put the Gambia at very fundamental and strategic positions in the world map when it comes to international trade, regional integration, and, you know, international diplomacy and relationship. So now, we, there is so much that is needed for the Gambia to pursue, and there is so much things on board. The issue is, let's talk about, about the talking now and talk about things. We talk the talk. You know, we walk, we, we walk the talk and talk the talk. The issue is, once we keep on talking too much and doing little, the Gambia is not going anywhere. And Senegal is winning, and it's winning big, and Gambia is losing, and we are losing big. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jalo. Dr. Conte. Yeah, um, actually, Dr. Jalo, I do respect your position. But again, um, uh, way back during when we got independence, and uh, most Senegalese actually used to come to Gambia to buy goods, to send them to Senegal. What actually happened to our ingenuity, I just don't understand it. But I'm just giving personal experience in a sense that since we all have different currencies and Senegal doesn't have a central bank, Senegal still pays taxes to France. The SAFER is paid uh, by, uh, uh, I believe to the Euro or if not by the, by, by the French franc. Senegal, uh, France still has control over 29 former colonies. So anytime we are trading with Senegal, we really are paying taxes to, to, to France. This the, I had a conversation with an economist who happens to be in a central bank of a non, I'm not gonna disclose the West African country. And his frustration was that anytime they met to discuss about economic issues, Senegal will not come as a country of its own. Senegal will join the other West African, uh, French-speaking West African countries. They come in a block. So we, we maybe that's what we also need to do. The English-speaking countries, we need to come together as a block. Uh, unfortunately, we are not. If you look, look, at the, look at the population of France, the population of France is what, 60 or 66 million? What is the population of Nigeria? Over 200 million people. So we are, we are, we are competing. When we compete with any French speaking with African country, even Senegal, we really are benefiting uh, uh, France. And that should be the realistic thing that we have to say, you know? So 
what look at what Usman Usman Sonko when he was running for office, this was what he was saying that most of the benefits that they have in Dakar actually finds its way where to France. Can you believe in 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 uh, in uh, what what's it, what Gabon? They will not even buy locally grown tomatoes. They felt like going to buy tomatoes from where? From France. And likewise in Senegal, I bet the same thing. There are certain areas in, in, in Dakar. They only speak French. So what I'm trying to say here is that, yeah, we can be neighbors, we can be friendly neighbors, but you are not going to berate me or look down on me. I experienced it myself. So the thing is that how can we compete economically? Gambian truckers on their way to Mali have been harassed by Senegalese police. And on their way from Mali to Gambia, they've been harassed too. But Senegalese truck truckers have freeway in our country. Should that be the case? We, I mean, yeah. the Gambia is a sovereign nation. If I, I, Listen, I have no problem with the Senegalese authorities stopping a Gambian trucker suspecting of what? Drug trafficking. I have no problem with that. But a Gambian trucker going to Mali, why do they have to be stopped and stay there for 72 hours? Is that fair? So these are things that we need to have open discussion. A, a, a gentleman told me something too. Okay, when he was going to Dakar to visit some family members, and he said, yeah, we are all brothers and sisters. He said he bought uh, four uh, bottles of drinks, okay? And he said he was drinking one when they got to, he didn't have any problem in Kara. But that police stopped right there in the, uh, it just less than, a, maybe you can even see them, maybe less than what, a, you can, I, I think it's no more than even 50 or 75 meters. He said when they got, when they, when they, when he got stopped by, by, by the police, they asked him, the other three bottles that he had with him, whether he was taking them to Senegal to sell them. And the man said, no, I'm going to be drinking them on my way. They told him, you have to pay tax on it, on them. And he said, pay tax on this? Say yes. And they refused for the driver to leave until either the guy paid the taxes or he empties the bottle, empty, empty the drinks. He got so upset, emptied all the three other bottles, and luckily a woman was coming. He gave the three bottles to, to, to the to empty bottles to the woman. So these are things that we need to discuss. Come on. So are you telling me if I'm and then he said he had a camera with him too? He said this was on another travel. He had a camera with him. They even had, they said that he was going to Senegal to sell the camera. And they told him that he had to he, he had to pay. Uh, uh, custom uh, duties on, uh, uh, on the camera. He said no. He said he turned around, and went back to the Gambia. These are things that we need to op we need to talk about openly. Yes, because, okay, the, come in, yes, yes. Yeah, I have a question on that because when it comes to that issue, uh, I don't know. I, I didn't get your point. Was it an alcohol or a drink or soft drink? Bimto, bimto drink. Yeah, but now when you are entering a new, a new country, that mm. is different from your country. There are laws that are applicable. So it's just like when you are also when you are boarding a flight, when you are moving into in, into the international space, you are entering a, a different country. You are on in, international territory. So with their rules, you have to with their customs, uh, custom entries that require certain commodities that are supposed to enter into country into countries like Senegal. I don't know because when it comes to even sugar and stuff like that, I have seen issues like that. Gambians will complain, but now mm -hmm. perception matters. But when it comes to perceptions. That's what we need to understand about personality and individual differences. Mm -hmm. But you know, individual differences has to do with the culture and then also how you comport yourself and how you ought to relate and interact with an officer. But if somebody stops you mm -hmm. and asks you of certain things because you're entering a foreign country with a foreign product, you know, countries have to, they have what we call restrictive trade. So it has to go on customs management. People need to understand the laws. So you have to adhere adhere to when you enter a country. It's just like when you travel from the United States yeah. and you are traveling to Brussels. Brussels. When you enter uh, or you're coming from the Gambia, coming through via New York and you go through Brussels, there are certain products they would allow you to, to pass through the airport. 
then you have to you have to, to throw it away because they will allow if you don't declare it. So custom procedures are needs to be adhered and governments need to understand and comport themselves. I have witnessed it, I was a victim myself, but I realized that even I've done it, you need to negotiate so they can allow it. Other countries they won't allow it. South Africa yes. is a typical example. I went to South Africa, I was having one bottle. Mm -hmm. Two years ago, I was only having one bottle of a sour gel. They didn't allow me when I was taking the transit uh, flight from South Africa to, Mar to Mauritius. So, uh, you know, the issue is we need to understand and what laws are applicable in Senegal. You know, they are, the Senegalese products are penetrated into the Gambian market. We understand it. But how do they get penetrated? How do they get penetrated into the Gambian market? We need to understand. Sometimes Gambians complain too much. And they will always tell you we are at a disadvantage. You know, even though you have stated something, I agree with your point, which I really respect it. But the issue is when it comes to regional blocks, you know, even though if we want to fight France, the issue is when integration comes in, we don't even establish a movement or a block because we want to fight that institution. But we are establishing a, we are establishing a block because we want to have a competitive edge. We want to build a competitive advantage. We want to make sure that we attract market. We want to make sure that they also attract investors from that country. Because now we cannot stand alone as a country. If we know we want to fight France, France also have investors that have money that would have been willing to invest into countries like the Gambia. And it also helps our market capitalization into the international market. So there are so many outliers out there that we need to understand so that when we are making conclusions, we'll come to the point that definitely in, in, in this context, this is what we call globalization, and we need to exist for, for the benefit of others. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jalo. Thank you very much. I, I think you are both right. Um, I just want to say this uh, pretty quickly, that um, when it comes to... Um, when it comes to the francophone bloc, um, it is it is true that they have been a they have been a uh, headache for um, Africa's uh, integration and the single currency idea. I think part of the reason they are at a stalemate still is because of the francophone countries' inability to transition mm -hmm. away from uh, French domination. Um, so I think that has been there, and we are all aware of that. Um, I hope they are able to resolve that issue. Uh, but also, again, um, you know, um, Senegal and the Gambia, if we are sincere about integration, uh, integrating, our econ integrating our economies, uh, we need to uh, remove some of these barriers uh, Dr. Conte and Dr. Dallo are both talking about. Um, I remember growing up as a kid, my father was a businessman, and I remember how many times his, his shops were raided by uh, customs people because they believe Senegalese goods were being sold there. <laughs> um, yeah, many, many times. And, you know, I, I think Gambia has moved away a little bit away from this. They have relaxed a little bit, liberalized trade with Senegal. Uh, so Senegal needs to open up too. We need a uniform trade policy. Um, I don't think uh, Gambian customs do that in the country anymore. Um, um, so um, Senegal needs to liberalize also when it comes to dealing with the Gambia on the, in terms of trade. Mm -hmm. We need to have a uniform trade policy so that people and goods can be able to move in and out of the country uh, freely. Um, notwithstanding, um, each government, um, you know, should, uh, it's a wall of competition, you know, each government should uh, stand for the interests of its uh, its own people. Dr. Kone, you want to say something? I want to move to my... I want to oh, actually, the, the... Uh, well, a point of intervention, a point of intervention. Okay. Intervention, uh, Mr. Jata, because you have stated that the, the Gambia uh, should have a uniform. I think we have uh, we have a very, uh, we have a, a regional and a uniform and national uh, state policy. The issue is, even though we want to liberalize, the economics are liberalized to an extent, but when it comes to product design and, you know, and then the traffic that inter trade, inter trade between the two countries. There are so many there are so many requirements that are required. And if the government product does not meet those criteria, it cannot go into Senegal. We we need to understand when it comes to customs that there is what we call the harmonized the, the, you know harmonized trade uh, system. You know because these are things that you need to understand. It is already already on the GATT, you know the global agreement on the, on tariff class classification. So even though that has to come back also with even in the, in, in the regional uh, block on, on, on ECOWAS. So liberalizing economies, that doesn't mean that Senegal should have a, an open policy whereby every government product will enter. 
they have to make sure that those products that enter into Senegal economy do not do more harm. So, and what then is- if they are lesser, and the quality has to put into consideration, there are so many things that are put into consideration. We need to be very careful in here. So, Senegal understand the game. It is the government that needs to adjust our sales. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dow. Dr. Conte, you have anything to say? Before well, I- all I just want our audience to know that despite our disagreements on some policies, we are still friends. So this is one good thing about the Gambia in perspective that the three of us online may not agree on everything. At the end of the day, we are still friends and we hope we can have a country. Uh, we can, the president of the Gambia, uh, Adam Obaro, and his supporters, even those who work at the state house, and now begin to realize that those who work in the state house may not actually 100% agree with what they uh, they are doing, and they have to also question some of the things that they are doing. And this is this is what makes a country a better place to live in. So I just want to share that uh, with the audience. Thank you, Dr. Quanta, for saying that. Absolutely, yes. Uh, you know we. We thrive on disagreements. You know, I see it as very positive. Disagreement is, you know, an ingredient for progress, for us to learn from each other. Uh, all of us, we all came from, um, I can say, you know, from an academic background. And we know um, disagreeing and dissenting and different perspectives um, is what uh, brings about uh, insight and progress and advancement. So we thrive on that. We, all of us here, uh, Dr. Jallo, and I'm I'm happy to be associated with Dr. Jallo and Dr. Conte. Uh, they are uh, academics, uh, not quite me, uh, but um, so um, they, are, they have this tradition of um, um, positive argument, positive disagreement. And I am pleased to be part of that. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, so, um, and you know, that's the reason we call this platform the Gambian perspective. We encourage different perspectives. Um, so, uh, that is a tradition we like to see in all Gambians. I uh, know uh, a lot of Gambians are still very, very adverse, very adverse to uh, criticism and disagreement. If you disagree with their point, they jump into attacks and insults and all that stuff. Uh, we don't do that. We don't do that here. We we disagree in order to advance uh, the discussion and to advance each other's views and learn from each other. And that is the tradition we have, and we want to encourage that. Um, having said that, uh, Dr. Conte, I want to I want to briefly talk about Halifa Salah's New Year message, and I'll give each of you to say something you might want to say. But this is going to be closing of this. We've been here quite a bit um, already. Um, um, last week, um, Mr. Salah, the Secretary General, the Interim Secretary General of PDOIS, Doi, um, gave his uh, Christmas um, New Year message to the, to the country. Um, but before I say this, uh, what is Mr. Salah's New Year message um, also uh, brought about uh, what is missing in the country? Uh, what is missing, Dr. Conte, Dr. Jallo, is UDP's New Year message. I did not find it anywhere. I was shocked. I was like, is this the first time UDP did not give a New Year message? Usually they give theirs before Barrow even did. Uh, so so um, at least they could have come out and say hello to us so we know they're here. You know, but um, uh, this is a party that has uh, almost like... Um, uh, um, uh, a, a parallel government to <laughs> to the battle government, uh, but this year, unfortunately, I did not hear the New Year message. Um, uh, so that is what was missing. Uh, but nonetheless, um, Halifa addressed the country um, pretty much. Uh, when I read it, it was more like a farewell address to me. Um, it is um, Halifa. Uh, basically telling us that the old guard, um, old guard politicians of uh, Adoy 
uh, basically in the process of handing over to the new ones. Um, you talk about the future and the evolution of the party uh, from its beginnings in the late 1980s. Um, um, and this is a situation that uh, many other political parties in the country, uh, UDP particularly, is going through also. Uh, it's going through major transformation, major changes. Uh, this uh, December election is not going to leave UDP intact. There is going to be, if the party can survive this at all, there's going to be major, major changes in the party. So that is something that um, uh, those parties, even GDC, uh, may, may undergo some upheaval. Um, we will see some movement uh, in all these parties um, following this year's election. Uh, but again, what um, Halifa Speed brought forward also is the challenge of being an opposition leader in the country. Um, not only in the Gambia, but much of Africa. Uh, it is very challenging in terms of um, uh, in terms of financial, um, in terms of finance, in terms of security. Uh, it's a huge sacrifice. Um, you begin to wonder whether uh, we will have. Uh, sufficient young people who are willing to make those sacrifices to take up leadership of these parties um, uh, in the coming years. I know DOI has a lot of young people who uh, could step in. Um, first off, I think Khalifa is the one who announced his departure uh, from elected office. He may still be active in the party, uh, but uh, Syria may still be around, and Sam, even though he doesn't uh, get too much involved. Um, uh, it's not so much as a face of the party, uh, but he might still be involved. And there is Adam Abba also, who may increasingly take up uh, more responsibility in the party. Uh, I mean, be more more um, in the front line. Uh, there are other people like uh, Sila, the Bandul North uh, candidate for DOI, National Assembly member for DOI. Uh, there are other young people like uh, Ms. Dukre, Jaha, um, you know, and there are others in the diaspora in UK, I believe, uh, like Suso, um, Kijera, um, you know, I think all of those people potentially, even um, possibly Pasamba Jao. Um, uh, I'm not very sure about the status of Jao in the party, but I think he's a DOI member also. And all of those people potentially could increasingly play uh, more significant and more prominent roles in the party. Um, but um, um, Halifa's uh, um, statement, uh, New Year's statement, is pretty much you know, a farewell address. And um, the country will, I will not say miss him, but I know he's still going to be, be available and be uh, doing significant work for the country. Uh, but um, Halifa will be well remembered by Gambians uh, for his unflinching um, uh, support and participation and defense of Gambian democracy and the sovereignty of the Gambian citizen um, uh, over, over nearly three decades. Um, if you're looking for one Gambian who is uh, absolutely consistent in his beliefs um, and his uh, defense of the Gambian citizen, sovereignty of the Gambian citizen, dedication to country, uh, it is Salif Um I think all Gambians will agree on that. And no matter what happens, um, Gambia will very much remember and appreciate it of what this man has done for the country uh, over the course of his life. Um, the same can be said of Sidia and Sam as well. Sam is the one I know very well, much more than Halifa and Sidia. I think I met Sidia only once. I never met Halifa personally. I met Sam many, many times. I sat in his living room. Um, I talked to him, you know. I used to see him almost every week when I was in Gambia. Uh, he was reviewing a, um, a material I wrote uh, one time. So we, we almost every weekend I'll go there 
and a very kind, very humble uh, guy. Uh, so, so I cannot just say enough about these people and what they have contributed and what they stand for, their values and their commitment to the country. Uh, but basically, that's what I wanted to say. I think Khalifa's speech is pretty much like a, a farewell address to the country. Uh, Dr. Conte, Dr. Jalo, if you don't have anything to add to this, I'm going to go ahead and close this. I also want to say that um, this um, this program for the first time is streaming live on YouTube also. Um, I connected, I made that connection um, uh, sometime last week, during the week. So as we do this program, it will be simultaneously streaming on my YouTube channel as well. Oh. So, so um, we, we thank, you for thank you for doing that. Absolutely, yes. So I, yeah, I, I know uh, I, I, I'm not privy now to Halifax's message, but I know I have uh, I've listened to it uh, previously. It was very good. And, you know, he has already emphasized uh, that he's retiring from uh, national politics, but he's not retiring uh, as an individual because he will yeah. still be there. Yeah. But I think also uh, Halifa has been somebody that has stood the test of time. He has proven himself yeah. as one of the most dynamic, uh, visionary, selfless, you know, independent-minded, uh, conscientious objectors, citizens with a different, somebody who is who who have seen the Gambia and has served the Gambia throughout uh, his life. He has contributed immensely to knowledge production. He has uh, also contributed positively to scholarship development. When I talk about scholarship, has to also relate with, uh, you know, adding value to recite and stuff like that in his area of expertise. And when it comes also to parliamentary debates and issues like governance and issues, Though he has, he might not have achieved all that he wanted in his in his uh, in his dreams or desires as uh, you know since joining politics as a young man to this extent, but the life that he has lived has proven that is a testament of somebody that could be whole look, that could be looked up to, uh, that a lot of people younger generations like me and any other person could look up to as somebody who is very selfless, somebody who has seen country first before the before self. And that is something that is clearly lacking in Gambia. But I think also him retiring uh, would not even make sure that he is not going to be in the public space because we still need his interventions. We still need his presence. Absolutely. And as of now, him retiring as you know, as a retired uh, politician, but also you know, as a democrat, as a good, as a senior citizen of the country. Well, there is so much that is uh, uh, expected uh, that uh, we are so looking on for to him that he also has to put in and play his course. His course. They are, you know, supporters and you know, sympathizers, you know. But the, if the UDP didn't do that, that was a that was a shortcoming from them. And we never anticipated that that would have happened. But we don't know what actually triggered. But I'm not in their shoes to uh, say what we are the reason. But I think uh, it was an oversight, and they would they could have come to the public and apologize why they couldn't. Because I know that they were also involved in you know in, in legal tussles with uh, with Adama, with his his excellency President Alec Adama Paro and the IEC. But I think have you know deflected the agenda of them not continuing that tradition because so many people look up to them also because they're also a very formidable opposition party we we hope them we wish them all the best in their future uh, political uh, you know aspirations but thank you thank you dr jalo dr Conte. well um when it comes to honorable halifa sara one has to wonder uh one doesn't have to wonder about his capabilities and his ethical principles and values. And he will be greatly missed for his engagement in the National Assembly. But he has also impacted, DOI actually has impacted the lives of so many Gambians. Over the years, particularly during this election, and engaging Gambians on Facebook, I can only think of only one DOI member who was dis disrespectful to me. So 
in a sense, you know, that uh, how do I engage its supporters and their behavior? I hope other political parties can try to uh, resonate something like that because we can disagree politically, but we don't have to be the enemies. We don't have to be using foul, foul words on each other. If you watch, I may be wrong in some instances, but what my personal engagement with uh, the DOI supporters, they really are very civil in their political engagements. And I hope the next generation or the next leader who uh, wants to continue on that can uh, do the same. But I also would like to add for, for, the, for, for DOI, to revisit its uh, strategy. Uh, Gambia has changed a lot. Do it needs to emulate other strategies that other political parties can do. Because I'm telling you, if Halifa had been the one selected to, to be president, and if Halifa is still president of the Gambia today, with no disrespect to Adam Obaro, I think the Gambia will be a different place. We won't even have to worry about the level of corruption that is going on. Uh, and then even looking at uh, the advice that uh, the PMO tries to give the president to increase salaries of 435%. And I hope uh, Adam Obaro and his supporters, and particularly those in the state house, and those who are at uh, PMO, to, to realize that there is no way that you can increase salaries to about 435%, not questioning where you're gonna get the money from. We're gonna miss Halifa, Halifa to be quite candid. Uh, it's a good man. And I wish we have more of Halifa salaries in our national assembly that can actually change the dynamics of how we Gambians think. think. I'm just gonna stop right there, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Conte. Thank you, Dr. Jalo. This is it. Thank you, guys. We'll meet again next Sunday. Okay, you all take care. Thank you. Mr. Jalo, Dr. Jalo, take care. Yeah, take care, doctor. We'll talk later, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye, uh, Mr. Jalo. Bye-bye. Yes.